Okay, uh, welcome everybody uh, to Podchat Live, um, and we are here live for episode number eighty-nine, and it is twenty uh, first of January, twenty twenty-one. And I decided to start adding the dates of when we record these because uh, a rather helpful uh, listener sent me an email a few weeks ago saying we should do that because sometimes they listen to episodes uh, from two, three years ago, and and they're about to call us out for being out of date, and they realise it's not a new podcast. So we're going to start dating these now. So we're here for episode 89. We are talking tendons with the one and only Dr. Peter Maliaris. We're delighted he's joined us early in the morning. Uh, So thank you for joining us, Peter. Um, Brief introduction. If you already know, if you're already very much into tendons, you do a lot of tendon reading, you, you know this name already, and so you should. If you're new to Tendon Research, if you're an undergraduate, this is a name that you you will and you should become familiar with. So Peter is a, a physiotherapist, he's a researcher, over, over 100 peer-reviewed publications, associate professor at Monash University, uh, he did his PhD in tendinopathy, he's uh, got the amazing website and online resource tendinopathyrehab.com, which we're going to link and, and signpost to, and we're delighted to have him for the next hour and just get to pick his brains uh, about tendons. So if you are watching live, uh, on via Facebook, please do feel comfortable in firing some questions his way. Craig will, as always, be monitoring those, and he will bring them in as and when they add to the discussion, and and then we can uh, get your questions to Peter as well. So, Peter, firstly, once again, thank you for joining us. Um, no, we are thank you very much for having me. We we are de- we're always delighted when we get sort of uh, area or you know uh, subject leaders in their field on because uh, yeah we get all excited that we can just ask them all the questions that we, we have ourselves. And I thought we might start because it sort of segues from your from what your PhD was in, which I believe looked at the identification of novel risk factors for tendinopathy. I wondered if we could yeah. use that as a, as, a, as a springboard really to start the discussion and, and just get your, your present day take on um, the classic question, what are the risk factors for developing a tendon problem or a tendinopathy? Oh, sure, no problem. I'm just plugging my laptop in. <laughs> yeah, definitely do that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to lose you. Leaping at me. But um, uh, yeah, so basically, uh, if you're looking at risk factors, it is um, it is uh, very much load is the, is the main one. And um, depending on the tendon, the load profile will be different. So I guess a lot of podiatrists are interested in lower limb. Uh, tendons and um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be really your running walking jumping type load so what we call stretch short and cycle type loading and um, uh, basically this is very high load for the tendon and it's very hard for the tendon to cope with so uh, it uh, it is that type of load and that's the that's by far the biggest risk factor but it's change in loading so if we take Achilles for an example it's people starting hill running uh, people starting, uh, you know, jumping, uh, maybe doing a boxing class in the gym or something. Uh, people, people starting, um, uh, people starting to run up hills. People starting to walk faster. People starting to increase their running and walking volume. You're looking for those factors. That's um, that's a key uh, sort of risk factor. That's, that's probably the biggest risk factor that we know of. And then you have all the other factors that change and predispose people. So, for example, things like, uh, you know, older people and people who are um, uh, less active, less healthy, metabolic factors. Um, so cholesterol, elevated cholesterol is a big, big one. Um, uh, there's also um, genetic uh, predisposition. Um there are hormonal factors. There are so females with um, you know menopause uh, at the time of menopause or when they have an irregular menstrual cycle. That is always a good question to ask because that can be a risk factor as well. Um, uh, there's a the, there's a whole host of of medication related factors. So taking fluoroquinolone medication, which is an antibiotic, you know, that can be a risk factor. Uh, so, so there there are lots of risk factors, but it's load primarily, and then the load basically uh, then uh, depending on your other risk profile, um, it's only a small amount of load or a large amount of load that will be required to for you to develop a tendon problem. Actually, listening to you to you run down that those risk factors, I kept ticking the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> There's only a few that didn't really apply to me. I thought, oh God, you know, <laughs> especially the boxing class one. But yeah, yeah. yeah, for, yeah. for those listening, we 
Craig, we just before we went live, Craig admitted to us he's given himself a tendonopathy. <laughs> we will we will be scratching that, uh, <laughs> uh, that a little bit later. Um, how important? Uh, well, clearly, when you when you list all these risk factors, the the fascinating thing for me when you listen to all those things is it, it gives a lovely sort of template for when someone comes in with with a, you know reporting tendon pain. Right there, you know, people also ask us fairly regularly. Oh, what does an initial assessment look like? Is there like a, a pro forma? Um, for someone right. that comes in with tendon pain, it sounds to me like that that list of things sort of formulate yeah. your your history taking. Is that a fair comment? And right. if so, how important is it that we identify what we think, what risk factor we think is at, is at play here? Right. Yeah, I think I, I think it is important to in your history to get an idea of um, those factors. So you want to you want to you want to know obviously their age and uh, past history of injury because that might also be relevant for, for what they've got. You want to know about um, uh, all their medical history for sure and medications they've taken. You do want to ask the right questions. So you do want to ask, you know, have you had any antibiotics that uh, may, you know, the fluoroquinolones that might sort of predispose them to a problem. So you, want, you do want to ask all those questions. Um, but you also want to know where the pain is. Uh, and I think... Thinking about the diagnostic side of it, it really comes down to the side of pain, where it is, and how the pain is behaving. So that is that is really important as well uh, from a history point of view. Um, uh, di diagnostic wise, we tend to see people with with relatively localized pain, um, and it depends on the tendon problem. But for Achilles, it's often very localized to the mid portion of the insertion. Um, same with patella, same with you know tib post. Uh, for some of the other tendons that we see, it's um, it's a bit you know it it's not as localized. So for say the hamstring tendon, uh, sometimes the gluteal tendon as well. Uh, but generally, you're looking for localised pain. You're looking for pain that has come on because of a change in activity. And, and that's the sort of change in activity factor again. You're looking for pain that is aggravated by activity in a proportional way. So it's aggravated by activity, and the more activity you do, the more aggravated it gets. It's often okay when they're doing activity, but it's worse after. And uh, that's that's also a really important sign. Uh, and sometimes, you, well, most of the time, you have morning stiffness as well. So morning stiffness is the symptom where you you know you're sort of uh, the first few steps in the morning is very very sore and, and you know plantar fascia and Achilles patients definitely get that. Sometimes other patients as well. So uh, so they're the sort of symptoms that you're looking for also from the subjective assessment. Um, really looking for those to see if you know the diagnosis is right and then you can confirm that when you do the objective assessment yeah let me just pick your brain on something quickly because i'm sure that many people are thinking it and we'd love to know when our patients ask us in the best way we should answer we'd love to know when your patients must ask you this question as well and i'd love to know how you answer it and that is with reference to that classic sort of tendinopathic pain pattern where they wake up and they're a bit stiff a bit creaky but they then report that after they've walked around for, for 10 minutes, it sort of eases off. It feel, they, they describe it as feeling like it's warming up. Um, when they're with respect to running, they may even sometimes say that first kilometer is pretty grisly. But once they, once they get going, they can comfortably do 10K, 15K, no pain at all. But then they get that kind of latent discomfort, that hangover. Uh, you know, you, you pay for your sins with, with a delay, a bit like you do with alcohol, so to speak. And, and quite a lot of athletes I see, even though that, you know, you, you explain to them this is fairly normal tendon behavior, they, they just can't, they want to know why. How, how if this tendon is bothering me, how can it be so happy with 10K running, but it's stiff in the morning or it's stiff for just 1K? Why does it get better with activity? What, what's the lay person description you would give to an athlete that asked you that question? I think I think it comes down to your whole sort of uh, description of how uh, tendon pathology comes about, and that uh, and that is that it's a cell-driven pathology. So, um, you know, when you have a when you're sort of going along at a certain amount of loading, uh, and then you change the amount of loading you're doing, the cell response changes. The um, you know the cell response is the key driver for adaptation of the tendon, but it's also the key driver for pathology. So as you uh, go into this new cell response, there's um, uh, there's there's this sort of biochemical uh, response that follows that as well, and um, uh, it's possible that uh, that biochemical response 
or it's likely that biochemical response is delayed. When you've done activity, uh, you get this delayed response and it, and it could be only two, three days later uh, that you're getting the full effect of the activity that you've done in terms of that cell response. So I think it's real, I think it's most likely related to the uh, to the sort of latent cell response within the tendon. Um, that's probably the most likely cause, and then that sets up this uh, you know peripheral sensitization. So tendon pain is a, is probably a peripheral there's a bit of debate about it but it's most likely a peripheral sensitization so it's a it's a local nociceptive pain it's pain that comes from the tendon and um um you know people will probably um debate that a, a fair bit and there is debate about that because um um of uh, some of the studies that are out there but i think it I think it's uh, the consensus is that it's 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 local nociceptive pain, and there may be contribution as it keeps going uh, to have more of a uh, you know central components to it uh, later on down the track. Uh, but uh, this local peripheral sensitization uh, probably is contributed to by some of the cell response in the area, and that's a delayed thing. When you wake up in the morning, you feel very, very stiff because you haven't moved it for a long time, uh, particularly with things like plantar fascia because, uh, and also Achilles because they're in a relaxed position. This is, this is just my, my sort of theory and thinking now, but they're in a relaxed position at night because you're in, you're in plantar flexion and you're relaxing at night. And um, uh, basically, they, uh, they're just not loaded at all. So when you start to load them, they're, they're, they're going through a loading cycle that they haven't experienced for a long time. Um, the other theory, aside from a cell-driven theory, is um, uh, the other theory is, is, a, is a theory of glycosaminoglycans or the, the ground substance. So sometimes, uh, well, it, it does happen after loading, you can get an increased amount of uh, the water uh, hydrophilic or water loving uh, proteins in the tendon and uh, they they are increased in concentration after the in pathology so uh, so so maybe the tendon becomes thicker and then uh, you know you're squeezing or wringing the water out as you start to let it again I don't think I, I don't think that's true I think it's more of a neurophysiological pain response that's related to cell driven uh, peripheral sensitization because I don't I haven't seen much evidence of that sort of uh, wringing out of water happening um, uh, with um, everyone that has a, a, a sort of morning stiffness symptom. Uh, that's just my sort of thoughts on it. Perfect. And one more, I want to get to some some myths surrounding tendons and tendinopathy in a minute, because we know that there's, there's, there's shed loads of them. But one last sort of clinical, pragmatic sort of question. We've talked about how load and a change in load is like the, one of the key risk factors for, for tendons becoming unhappy. Um, and we also talked there about high things like obesity or high cholesterol being feeding into the kind of metabolic kind of um, risk factors not uncommon to see someone come in who perhaps is slightly larger uh, or if we're going to use the medical term on the chart would be considered clinically obese and as a result of that they have started some kind of exercise program very much with losing weight in mind um, mm -hmm. so they're not doing too much what we would consider too much but it might be a significant change in load for them is it even important for us to do this? And if, if not, great. But if it is, how do we delineate between the potential metabolic contributors in someone who's overweight uh, and they've presented with a tendinopathy versus, yes, they're overweight, but actually the ten it's just a classic load load management error? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, a, it's really hard. Uh, I would go as far as saying that whenever you've got someone who is overweight, uh, obese, that you should target that factor. Um, I think you should, I think it's important to at least have a discussion with them and say that this is probably contributing and we used to think that it's contributing because it's a, it's a load factor, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not so clear now that it's just load that is um, increasing the risk of endonopathy. It could also be that uh, there's other metabolic uh, reasons for that increase in, in risk. So I think it's... Um, uh, yeah, really important to uh, to address that as a factor, and uh, it's a hard thing to address. But I, I, I mean, I, I tend to 
my clinic is a bit different because I work in a tertiary referral clinic. So I see patients who have failed a lot of exercise most of the time. And that's the first line thing that I, you know, that I would go to as a treatment. But most of my pa patients have failed it and done it. So it's, a hard, it's a hard job for me just convincing them to do exercise again. And um, I, uh, I, I always look for other factors like can they lose weight? always because it's it, it's just the patient profile that i see it's, they've done a lot of the exercise and i think adding other things will be helpful for them um and i think it's very important but if even if you're seeing them as a first contact uh, i would definitely recommend you know looking at the looking at weight and you know as we all know it's a really really hard thing to to, to do for yourself and even part of the patient so um it's not easy but it's it is something that uh, you can get some really good you know outcomes for some people and definitely worth uh, considering yeah perfect perfect craig before we delve into the the myths one by one are there anything anything on facebook that anyone's asked oh, that's there, there, there is a question but it's a, a treatment related question so i'll hold it over um, lovely we'll get to that yeah, yeah. well a, a lot of our myths i think it's, it's going to be clear that are kind of probably treatment related anyway so whenever the right time is craig just just uh, dive in let's start um with sort of uh, the, the, the old classic nomenclature. So th this thing that, that throughout all of our careers, and my, my career is only 20 years young, which I know is younger than, than Craig's. I'm sure you've got more experience than me as well, Peter. But through my career, I can recall a time when it was an itis. Um, it, it was a tendonitis. Then it was then that wasn't cool. It was a tendinopathy. Then tendinosis got thrown in. Then something else said tendonitis again. And there's been this big debate about this continuum model. And mm. let's just kind of get your take once for all, like inflammation. Hmm. What role? What role does it play in tendinopathy, if if at all, and when? And off the back hmm. of that, what what should we be calling these things, uh, or what should we not be calling these things? Hmm. Yeah, so uh, it started off as uh, it started off as very much an inflammatory problem, uh, and that was back in the sort of seventies where it was called tendinitis. Um, and then people believed that it was just an inflammatory problem, and if you gave it anti-inflammatories, it would improve and it would get better. Uh, and we, we, we learned that that wasn't the case. And then, uh, and then it became, uh, then Hocken Alfredson came along. He's a very famous uh, tendon researcher who, uh, you know, did really good studies at that time, uh, was looking for things like prostaglandin E2, which is a big driver of inflammation, and uh, did not find any evidence for prostaglandin E2 in these studies, and therefore declared that it wasn't inflammatory. Uh, but then, so then we went to tendinosis and that was in the probably 90s i think uh and, and everyone started calling it tendinosis uh, which is sort of you know um i guess related to osteoarthritis thinking that this is just a this is this is a degenerative process uh then uh that's when the continuum model sort of took hold and we started talking about reactive and degenerative and um and then uh, since then, in the last 10 years, a group from Oxford has done some really good work around inflammation. They're headed by a lady called Stephanie Dakin, and um, she has done some really good work looking at different drivers of inflammation, not just the prostaglandin pathways, so but mast cells and immune cells. And uh, they have shown some definite evidence of inflammatory drivers in tendinopathy. So we are, we've sort of gone full circle, but we were looking for the wrong drivers. And uh, now we're, we're finding the right uh, drivers. And it, uh, it's, it's um, you know, it's sort of starting to change our management and, and our thinking around tendinopathy. We know that there are, um, you know, inflammatory pathways within tendinopathy. Um, we, in terms of nomenclature, we uh, now call it tendinopathy because that's just the easiest thing to call it. It uh, goes away from the need to call it something that is related to a pathology. So um, when you're talking about uh, you know tendinitis or tendinosis, uh, there's always a um, a link with you know this is the pathology that we're trying to describe. Uh, but here with tendinopathy, it's um, it's it's just uh, it's just a term that relates to pain and pathology within the tendon. We're not making any assertions about what that pain and what that pathology is. We're just saying it's tendinopathy. We had a big uh, icon. We're, we're we're sort of got a consensus group, an international consensus group in tendinopathy. We're called the Icon Group, 
and uh, we've, we've published three papers so far in British Journal of Sports Medicine, and they're basically consensus about uh, the terminology, about um, if you're doing research, what sort of outcomes you should use. And um, so they were published last year uh, in, in British Journal, and uh, basically we decided that the term should be tendinopathy. It was extremely, extremely underwhelming because we all got together and we... <laughs> huge meeting and then at the end of the day we just decided that we all just decided that it should be called tendinopathy and uh, we all went home but um you know, and, it, and it's sort of the sensible thing but we needed to have a consensus and to put out a statement because you know as you say it, it is confusing and a lot of people still call it tendonitis or call it other things and um you know you needed uh you know 26 experts to come around and just say yes let's call it this you yeah know? And this sort of feeds into our second myth um, in that we, we could all, as, as clinicians, argue and, and, and flex uh, over whether what we want it called or why. But there's, there's a sort of knock on effect or ramification of it, of, of the itis, I think. And it feeds into our second myth, which is should we, we should we should rest painful tendons. And certainly the, the message I know a lot of my athletes in the, in the last 10, 15 years were getting was, you've got an inflamed tendon well any other part of my body's inflamed i take anti-inflammatories and i and i rest it i would never i would never exercise something or load something or use something that was inflamed and it became a real uh, prohibitor or hurdle to actually get people to do rehab so could we talk a bit about why why resting a tendon is is, is, is not a good idea yeah, that's a really good point because definitely it is um, the problem with tendonitis is that it is associated with a certain treatment pathway, and uh, we we do want to avoid that because we know that just resting and just doing anti-inflammatories is not going to help the tendon in the long term, and that's that's just what we see with you know countless um, experience over time, but also just in the studies, it's short it's a short term fix. It's gonna, you're going to feel great if you rest the tendon and if you take anti-inflammatories, but when you start to load it again, it, it's going to be sore again. So you, you, just can't, you just can't go down that approach and expect that it's going to get better unless, unless you get you know, really lucky and that you know, is enough time to, uh, you know, you're always going to get the anecdotes of people that do do that and they get better. And um, basically, that's probably because they've just been so lucky that they've rested enough to reduce the pain, and they've gradually got back to activity. Um, and I think I think that's that's really the underpinning principle of tendinopathy management, and that is get rid of the pain. Uh, and often that involves reducing the loading that you're doing that is provocative, and then start to load it gradually again. That's sort of the under, uh, underpinning principle. So, um, you know, I really think uh, people can sometimes do that themselves successfully, but uh, this this view that that uh, we should rest the tendon is is a bit is is a bit dangerous because uh, people will uh, get into the uh, trap of resting feeling great going for a run um and just you know feeling you know a, a real flare up again so i think um I, I sort of talk a lot about load capacity of the tendon and if you've got a tendon that if you've got a tendon that is not loading you know, if, if it's down here somewhere and you've got to eventually get it to here uh with a loading capacity you can't go from that step to that step just all in one, you've got to do it gradually. And that's, and so, so regardless of resting, I guess the point is you still have to go through some progressive, you know, a level of loading to get to a, a place where you're happy with that loading. So, so even if you do rest, uh, resting is not, I guess, yeah, this, this is the thought that's come to me now, but I guess resting is not the problem because we do, we do come to when people rest. Uh, and now we call it relative rest, but um, the problem is what they do after, and that is they expect to be healed after. So resting doesn't heal you; it just allows you to, to reduce the symptoms in the short term. Yeah, I think I remember someone. It may have been Tim Gabbett talking about you know his, his spike in load, and like you've just said, off the back of a rest, if, off the back of doing nothing, anything you do potentially as a spike isn't it so um yep. we, we're gonna for the people listening who want to know what uh, you know load good load management or good management looks like we're very much going to get around to that we're hoping that as we 
cross off all these myths it'll it'll become clear what what good management looks like if we highlight what bad management looks like and fascinating you say there you know rest it for a bit it feels a bit better run again and it gets sore the amount of patients that perhaps present to us in clinic for the first time and that's kind of the way they've been self-managing for three four five months before they finally decided maybe i should go and i should go and see someone so another part of that history i think that if that if that comes up in the history it may it really raises that thought that you've you've got a tendon problem what about the other the other thing that often is associated or attached to that is people saying i've been resting it and i've also been stretching or i've also been foam foam rolling or i've i've seen a sports masseuse and they've worked on my on my calves so we'll, we'll bunch if it's okay to do so we'll bunch stretching and foam rolling and and massage all into kind of one one big pot and we'll just talk about yep. your your opinion on those do they have a place at all if so when or, or are they sort of um do they go along, alongside resting the things that people seem to think they need to do, but actually they're, they're no help whatsoever? Mm. Um, they probably, they, if I can answer it from a from st starting point, from an evidence point of view, yeah. uh, from an evidence point of view, they don't, there's not a lot of supporting evidence for those uh, adjunct therapies like massage and, you know, uh, foam rolling and things like that. Uh, from a, um, from a um, uh, from a point of view of um, could they help the tendon? It's hard to make an argument for how they can help the tendon uh, in short term relief of symptoms. So when you're thinking about, people often ask, what what's so good about exercise? Why does that help? And it's a good question because there's no there's no obvious mechanisms by which exercise improves pain. Um, you know, we don't. There's no sort of you know. Uh, a sudden reduction in your sort of pain system just because you're doing exercise. Um, I we've talked about the cell-driven, most likely responses that you get in tendon with loading, and that leads to pain. And um, uh, you know, how does loading help that we, is not clear. Um, how loading helps, but it, the loading does at least improve the ability of the system to uh, to absorb load load to be stronger to be so it does you can see benefits from exercise maybe not directly to pain but uh, in other in other aspects but with uh, things like massage and foam rolling etc dry needling you can't really see anything aside from short-term pain relief and that may be a good thing for some people so i use a lot of shockwave in the clinic and i think it's uh, you know good for short-term pain relief and um, a lot of people find that it's beneficial for short-term pain. I use it for that. But, uh, you know, you've got to make sure you're doing something else as well, like uh, uh, exercise or something else that's going to also improve their strength and function. Uh, so so that's sort of, yeah, I think I think it's okay for people to be doing it as long as they're uh, aware of, you know, mechanisms, the likely mechanisms, and also what place it has, I guess. Yeah. So, so she, she, sorry, Craig, go on. I'm just going to ask, look, just, just extending that, that myth thing a little bit. A few years ago, I was doing something, I had to prepare something on posterior tibial tendinopathy, the tendonitis, not the dysfunction. So I just Googled it to see what was available for the general public. And by far, the two most common recommended treatments were stretching of the tendon, and they showed diagrams of how you stretch the posterior tibial tendon. I thought, well, when you look at the function of that muscle and tendon, how having a longer one would make any difference was I could, but then the second most common or the as, as equally common was strengthening the post tib muscle, and they showed diagrams of exercise how to strengthen it. And I still kept thinking, well, you got a tendon here that's sore, and you got a muscle here, and you make that stronger. How's that going to help that tendon there? And it, it, I was really quite perplexed. And th these were a lot of these were blog posts, you know, a lot of clinical websites writing for their patients, stretching and strengthening were the two most common recommendations for that tendinopathy. And I I was really quite puzzled. But is it possible that it's not the range of motion from stretching or the strength, the actual absolute strength that matters? It's the process of doing the stretching, the process of doing the strengthening helps load the tendon. Uh, so could, so the mechanism wasn't range of motion, wasn't strength. It was the light. Like I, I was really perplexed just how commonly recommended those treatments were. Well, it's it's the mechanisms that the reason where where we are now with tendon rehab is because people have always thought about it as um, a 
you've got a if you've got a tendon problem, you've got to load the tendon to get the tendon stronger. That was the that was the original thought. Um, so you've got a tendon problem. What you've got to do is you've got to load the tendon, and that will somehow elite adaptation or improvement in tendon pathology. What we know is that that doesn't happen. So you don't necessarily get improvement in tendon pathology from the way that it looks on imaging. Uh, so we're thinking that. Yes, it does help strength, but the mechanism that we thought works maybe doesn't work. It's not about strengthening the tendon. Um, and you're right, it's hard to see the mechanisms. Uh, why does it improve if you've got this, you know, if you've got a burst, uh, you've got sometimes there's bursa tissue or paratenin tissue, tenosolovia involved. How does loading help that? It's not clear. And um, it's the mechanisms are not clear. Uh, so I, I don't. Yeah, I think it's it's sort of um, uh, it's something that we need to learn more about. Uh, my argument to that at the moment is that a lot of the patients I see have got real functional deficits, and they need strengthening just to be able to walk, to be able to, to load. Some people loading is is really we know for sure loading helps function, and uh, that's yeah. what you do it for. If it helps pain, is really debated and really not clear, and we we. Um, we know that for some people, they the two things work in parallel. Their pain improves as you load them, but is that because of the loading? Is not clear. Uh, it could be because of completely other factors, like they've just gained some confidence, or uh, time has elapsed, or the the the, the, the uh, cell driven responses have, have settled because they've reduced some of the other activities. So it's not it really yeah it's a, it's an interesting area, but it's 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 not clear that you know exercise is not this panacea for pain where it just improves pain. Uh, you know uh, when when people do it definitely. Well, and another area that, again, perplexed me as well, there, I, I'm aware of two studies that have looked at gluteal function, you know, the EMG and those with Achilles tendinopathy, and they found differences. Now, to me, that's called limping. Um, but that's been taken in some areas, and I, I, I've seen, you know, the treatment for Achilles tendinopathy is to strengthen your glutes based on those studies, mm. and which is just not the case at mm. all. Um, now, that doesn't mean there shouldn't be rehab up there, exercises there, because there's something gone mm -hmm. wrong. But I see that as a consequence of the limping, not not actually as part of the, you know, and I, again, it just, it just yeah. puzzles me with how people take these studies and make these massive yeah. leaps. And, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Don't get me started on that. Uh, <laughs> that, is, uh, that is, yeah, very frustrating. But that this is the same with the isometrics, uh, you know, uh, thing that we're in now where, uh, you've got uh, Ebony Rio, uh, good researcher, uh, starts to do some research looking at brain function and isometrics uh, and discovers that um, maybe there's some changes that happen with isometrics in terms of pain in the short term. Now, what her study was about was short term improvement in pain uh, with, uh, with isometric loading. What it's useful uh, by a lot of people is now using it as a rehab tool to rehab people through three months, which is, you know, completely uh, uh, sort of different to the intended uh, research that she did uh, right at the start. So, so people taking research out of context is a big, big problem. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, 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 it, is, it is frustrating. I'm certain we're going to get to isometrics shortly, actually. Um, and I was uh, I was under the impression from my physio colleagues in London that that strengthening the glutes fix everything. So I'm going to have words with you tomorrow. Morning. <laughs> I'll speak to you tomorrow tomorrow morning about that. Um, <laughs> crab walks for everyone. So is a reasonable, uh, a really crude summary that we got to get this tendon desensitized. We have got to get pain down, and almost within reason, whatever someone decides to do, and it may have okay evidence like shockwave. It may have horrible lack of evidence like class four laser for example but whatever they decide to do that helps them um real or, or unreal sort of desensitize that tendon reduce their pain that's okay as long as it's not all they do as long as it's combined with that loading protocol that good rehab is that a reasonable summary yeah i think that is fine uh as long as they are allowing enough time uh to do the exercise and to do it well and I think that is uh, one of the hard things because I seeing the seeing patients in clinic. It's not it's not easy to like the principles of exercise are easy, 
But applying the exercise can be quite hard because you've got patients of all different levels, all different uh, functions, all different pain presentations and um, all different uh, series of equipment and all different sort of, uh, sort of, I guess, um, also preferences towards exercise. And you've got to fit exercise to all those needs and it is not easy to individualise exercise. It's easy to say, right, do a car phrase. But to actually do a car phrase that's effective, there are so many different variations and different things you can do to make it effective for the person, and um, and that's and that's and that's really uh, and I think that's the difference between people having a good outcome and not uh, sometimes. So um, so I think having enough time to uh, individualized exercise probably does take a half an hour session some, for, sometimes for some people. So it's, uh, so as long as you're not, uh, and you know, if you're doing other things, you sort of reduce that time, I, I think. Yeah. And I've certainly seen patients that to no fault with their own have fallen into a trap of seeing a clinician who's just shock waving or lasering them once every week or once every fortnight without the accompanying mm. stuff. And they, they, they say it works, but only for a short mm. time. And I can mm-hmm. say that's the, that's the same as it not working. So um, <laughs> I guess it comes, it comes down to how we're, how we're kind of mm-hmm. educating the patient and setting expectations mm-hmm. of what management should look like. Before mm-hmm. we go on to, mm-hmm. we talked a bit about isometrics, mm-hmm. about individualising, I'll definitely come back to that. Um, before we do, I had one more thing on my list to mention before we, you know, about, about uh, potential myths. I don't know whether myths is the right word here, but can we talk about the the injectables? So uh, cortisone or, or PRP or high high volume, you know, um, all sorts of various things people like to, to to jab into people. Where do we currently stand present day? Where does the what does the science of the day tell us about uh, injections for tendinopathies? Uh, so you've got uh, steroid injections, and they have very good effect, but in the short term. So they do work, um, and uh, they they're very strong anti-inflammatory drugs. They work, but they work in the short term only. So they don't they don't have a long lasting effect. So a lot of people have them, and then they feel they feel good, but then they comes back again. Um, and that's the steroid medic- that's the steroid drugs. Um, and then you've got um, the other main. Uh, common ones is the PRP injections, which is the platelet-rich plasma, and the the evidence for those drugs is not very good. So they, um, if you look at the placebo controlled trials, it shows that they don't actually work that well versus placebo. Um, there's not not much evidence versus placebo. So uh, so that's yeah. So the it's very underwhelming the evidence, unfortunately for injections in general because you've either got ones that work in the short term or don't work at all um, and I uh, still consider injections in the, the whole pathway uh, obviously I work with you know other sports docs and things here and um, if someone's if, if someone is not improving after three months then you want to get an opinion from someone and you send them to a sports doc and depending on that sports doc's views they might get an injection and it actually might be a steroid or it might be a uh, PRP and I think partly that's because there's not really many other options a lot of the time um, but you do want to uh, make sure that you've exhausted all your other options first uh, so you've done really good rehab you've done really good other, you know everything you need, think you need to do with load management etc uh, before you do set you know, consider that um, that's I think a key point and it does take you know sometimes months for people to get better it does it, it you know you you might find that uh, you've got someone who you're doing rehab with for you know five six months before they really start to improve um, or really start to be happy with their progress so um, and and I think part of the skill that um, I think you develop seeing a lot of tendons is uh, to keep people motivated when it is such a long rehab and to keep yourself thinking you are on the right track. Uh, I think as a young clinician, you sort of fall into the trap of thinking, um, I'm not sure this is, this is I'm doing the right thing just because it's, it might be through, you know, it might be six, eight weeks and it's not really improving. And then you sort of think this is, maybe I should get an opinion here. Uh, whereas when you develop more experience, you sort of think, you know, let's 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 continue and let's and let's see what happens in the next few weeks. So, um, so I think that you know, and having that confidence 
uh, in yourself as a clinician that that is then uh, that is then also um, that confidence is then transferred to the patient to continue with the rehab. So so I think that's that's important. Yeah, and that sort of ties in with what Martin looks like. He's just said. Of, is the point of an in, of an of an injection to give you that window of of opportunity for for rehab, and it's a bit like we just said with you know one of the mechanisms for getting pain down, but rehab still is is the king. Is that you know is that the message there? Yes, it is. Yeah. So you've got uh, if you've got someone who you think is really struggling with pain, um, then you, you you do go through all your you know. Uh, things that you can do for pain, you might do give them. You know, I, I'll take an example of an Achilles patient. I, I would probably um, use a heel wedge. Um, I would uh, reduce their loading. I would uh, possibly uh, recommend anti-inflammatories, oral anti-inflammatories. I would, um, you know, recommend ice. Uh, I might even tape them uh, to offload the ankle, and you know, all these things you can do before you end up going for an injection. And then once they, um, once you decide, look, I, I need some help with this, then you sort of, then uh, you know, then it's reasonable to think, you know, maybe you will get a, a window uh, to improve their symptoms with the injection. So that's sort of the last, last, last resource. Yeah, yeah. cool. Could I quickly yeah. uh, ask you your your opinion on how helpful you find imaging, diagnostic imaging? Because you, I think you already touched on the fact that. The uh, the way the tendon looks structurally on imaging it doesn't always correlate well with pain, um, mm. and the way it looks structurally pre and post treatment intervention doesn't always uh, differ mm. greatly. So how mm. how helpful do you find it, um, or, or is it more unhelpful than helpful in some cases? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I uh, I use I use it for differential diagnosis. So you might have someone um, who has a. It's it's very useful for looking at other pathologies that are that might be involved. So uh, I'll take an Achilles example again. Um, you might see that they've got thickening of their Achilles, but they've also got a peritoneal problem uh, or fluid. They've also got a plantaris problem um, and then that might slightly change your management. In the short term, it probably won't change your management because you still do the non-surgical things and the non uh, and the conservative things. But in the long term, it might direct your injection management. Uh, if you if you have, say, someone with a plantaris who uh, is not improving with the uh, first line treatments that you're offering. So it, it, it is good to get a good diagnosis from the start because it will then target things later, later on down the line. Um, I also use it a lot for education purposes. So um, with the education, I I do image, I, I image all the lower limb tendon patients from the knee down that I see in the clinic here, and um, it's it's just so useful. Patients love imaging because they feel like they have a hold of what's going on, and um, you know it's you know the amount of time someone has said to me. This is the you know this is the first time someone's actually told me what's wrong, and that's what people see with imaging. They they sort of trust imaging much more than they trust us. Clinical uh, <laughs> diagnosis. So it's, it's it's good to have that tool because you can say to them, look, you've got this. This is what's going on. It's um, you've got these changes in your tendon. It doesn't mean you need surgery. It doesn't mean you need any injections. Um, it just means that you need to, you know, you need to address this with the approaches that we've talked about, and I think you'll be able to get over it. Although the tendon won't change very much, you will get better in terms of your function and pain, and maybe in the long term, over years, the tendon will also improve as well. So it's that sort of education, and that sort of, you know, reduces the anxiety about, you know, it's, it's, it, is it going to rupture or am I going to have... Is there something really major going on there? Uh, even if there is major things going on, I, I, I see a lot of patients with really severe pathology and I still give them the same sort of education and, and they're reassured by that. Uh, even if even if it is quite thick and, and doesn't look very good, the tendon, um, they can still be very reassured by imaging. So I find it, I, I do find it good. Now, I'm not advocating that everyone should go out and get imaging and and do that that that's it's not necessary 
but uh, it is um, it can be helpful for reassuring patients. Definitely. Yeah, you can almost you can almost you can almost see that scenario where someone was told they had an inflamed tendon and they were terrified to move and they were resting it and you, they come in and like you say you scan them and you say look like your tendons you're sore but you're safe we need to load this and we now know we're safe to load this and they're, they're probably leaving like you say that level of reassurance says oh, I, i'm i'm safe i'm safe to yeah. exercise now because dr yeah. maliari scanned me so yeah. i can totally see yeah. the value there yeah. um, and, and i think you can achieve that with just words as well without the image i think you can achieve that reassurance for them without the image but it's it's for some people harder uh for for, for them to believe you if you don't do the image yeah yeah yeah. Mm. So we're coming up to, I guess, the closing 10 minutes, just looking at the clock. So it's probably time to talk about good management um, and a good load management. We've already talked about um, all of the, the adjuncts, but you touched on one word I want to come back to, which is how we individualize the, the, the treatment programs. I think most people now are, are pretty up to speed with knowing that we probably shouldn't rest tendons. We should probably, you know, exercise is, is, is medicine or whatever the, the latest kind of um uh, tagline is i'm not sure what's trendy at the moment but i do see or you do hear of a lot of people that then say okay well here's here's the exercise sheet then here's the, here's the recipe book and mm. like you've already mentioned it usually says right we'll start with isometrics for pain and then we'll move on to eccentrics and you know mm. i guess i'd like to get your take on is someone who's giving out just a recipe book approach to exercises who isn't really doesn't really know what they're doing and they're not individualizing it is that better than doing nothing or is it better it's probably better than the old-fashioned approach which is just rest and take anti-inflammatories but what 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 it's clearly not ideal what should ideal management look like mm. the first uh thing is to make sure that you get a, a handle on the pain and um that is that is really really important so and that and that's the load management so reducing some of the provocative activities that we've talked about and it could involve some of the adjuncts that we've talked about um but once you've done that then and even in parallel to that you can be doing some loading uh and the loading i guess the key thing with loading is uh people often with a recipe it targets the middle ground so you get your three sets of 12 or three sets of whatever and you do car phrases and um, it targets people who are not too, too dysfunctional. And, um, but they're also uh, not very good. Uh, so they're in the middle somewhere where that amount of loading is fine for them. But if, you're, if you've got someone who's really uh, not very good, dysfunctional, they might be older, uh, they might be sort of a 70 year old person with an Achilles problem, they can't even do a car phrase or, they can't do three car phrases, that's not going to work for them. And you, you get a need to then individualize and do other things. And it might be isometric loading to start with in certain ranges. It might be uh, knee bent car phrases leaning onto a wall so that part of the weight is taken by the wall and they're not raising their body weight. Uh, there's you know various things you can do to try and get that person to uh, doing a better car phrase. So that is you're not going to work if you do a standard approach and then by the same token if they're very good so they can do the three sets of 10 already uh then and they're sort of athletic it's not going to work either because they need more than that so um it sort of targets the middle ground and is okay for them but that's a very that's a that's a minority of patients that you'll see with an achilles problem or in a, a tib post or a plantar fascia problem so uh so it does need you, you do need to have a, a whole pathway of rehab from the very bad to the very good patient that you can give and often the very good is involved in jumping and running and hopping and other things as well so so it is it is you know it's it is the principles are simple but the progressions and when to put the progressions in uh that is that's where the difficulty comes and um uh and, and you know by no means is it do i think it too complex for people to learn but uh i think with with uh um, with physios and podiatrists, um, definitely I would encourage them to do these things themselves. But you do need to spend the time to be able to uh, learn how to do the progressions, but also then to be able to spend the time with the patient to actually make sure they're doing it properly. And uh, that's where the difficulty is. And I think I think if you do that, it's a, it's it's really rewarding because you'll you'll get to a point where 
you know, you, you can you feel like you can help these people a bit more, but the difficult ones. Um, so that's the sort of individualized. So, uh, and then once you find the point where they start, depending on their pain and their function, then you start to progress them through that progression and you take them to the point that they need. So if it's a walking patient, uh, you might get them to a little bit of loading with car phrases. If it's a running patient, you'll get them to a lot more loading and you'll also get them to hopping and other things as well. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's sort of the, the sort of, um, I guess, summary of it. Yeah, and we're kind of talking, I guess, about how we, we're dosing the, our exercise, aren't we, if that's the right word to use. So how do you know, I mean, what's your main measure for whether you've got that right or wrong? Are you going on patients' feedback of pain? And, and, and if so, I've had a lot of people say to patients, you know, you can't expect these exercises to be pain-free. We're not looking for a zero yeah. out of 10. Um, what, what, mm. what sort of uh, narrative do you give to your patients with regard to what pain to expect and how we know whether we've... Uh, mm. overdosed or underdosed mm. so with the pain generally minimal pain is acceptable so minimal to moderate pain um uh, I, I would generally use that that those terms so if they if they if they experience anything that they perceive to be severe pain then they shouldn't be doing that exercise um and you can really uh, educate them about you know picking those cues up and changing if that's the case and that's sort of your job in the assessment uh, when you see it in the clinic as well to assess you know the low tolerance to various things uh, but the other challenge is just the functional challenge so even if they can even if they don't have much pain um, are they actually doing the exercise with the right technique uh, in a way that's actually going to make them stronger and um, and that is that's not something the patient can help with very much because they just uh, don't know whether they're doing it right or wrong and often patients will rush their exercises do it fast etc and that's something that we need to observe in clinic and um, they're the other cues that you need to give so where are they how are they actually doing the exercise um, so pain is very very important uh, but that's just one of the uh, sort of pathways that you're doing with with this rehab perfect and where if you and this is this is one of those horrible questions to someone who's studied tendons for decades but if someone watching who is new to tendons or perhaps we've got some undergrads undergrads watching who are this has piqued their interest they want to kind of dive into some literature i know we've already linked to craig's already linked to the bjsm one of the bjsm consensus statements you mentioned but if you if someone sort of has time to read two or two or three papers uh, other than booking on your tendinopathy rehab course that Craig just put up there as well. Uh, if, someone, if someone has time to pull a couple of papers uh, from their university library tomorrow, um, what's, a, what's a really nice place for you to start? Are there any immediate papers that come to mind where you say everyone should, should read that one? Yeah, so things like um, if you look at the, the um, uh, Magnussen papers, they give a very good overview. Uh, Peter Magnussen is a researcher from Denmark um and he's got a couple of very good reviews i think one of them is in nature reviews um and they just go through the whole sort of pathology management they're very good um uh if you look at some of the oh the, the probably the best thing to look to start with is the uh, journal of orthopedic sports physical therapy um uh, special edition of tendinopathy that was published in 2015. Um, so if you look at that, there's there's probably about 15 tendinopathy focused papers on Achilles, on Achilles patella, gluteal, um, you know everything basically. And uh, they the, the narrative reviews, so they give clinical opinion plus uh, plus the evidence. That would be the, that, would, that would probably be the best starting point. We've got one in there. Um, on patella but there's also uh, sort of you know other ones as well uh, so that's, that's a good starting point perfect i can see i can i know craig's body language he's 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 on he's finding <laughs> it right now i can see him looking for it and he's going to put it up yeah um, i found the he found it great we'll link to all of these uh, at the bottom uh, craig is there anything else uh closing couple of minutes uh, Look, there there, there's, there's a couple of questions here that sort of came out of sequence but maybe we peter if he's got time later can come back and ask them but i just I just yep. have one question, maybe a myth type question, maybe not, but and I, I'm guilty of this and I'm not guilty of this and I'm sure you've done this and not done this. Is the plantar fascia a tendon? Like when you, you're going to go to a textbook on tendinopathy, 
should there be a mm. chapter on the plantar fascia in that textbook on tendinopathy? <laughs> or is, yeah. I, 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 I mean, sometimes I include it, sometimes I don't. You know, like it's, a, yeah. Mm. It's, a, it's a good question because sometimes you're doing, a re like I, we, we often have this problem when we do reviews uh, in our research group. We sort of think, well, we'll review on lower limb, uh, lower limb sort of whatever exercise or whatever, and we think, oh, should we include the plantar fascia? Uh, and, and you'll always get a reviewer if you do include it, saying, uh, why did you include it? Include it? If you don't uh, include it, you'll get a reviewer saying, why didn't you include it? So yeah. it, it's one of the things that provides people. I personally believe it is a tendon because it behaves like a stretch shortened cycle tendon in taking load when you're doing um, you know, impact activities. So I, I believe it's it, it functions like a tendon. And if you think about the heel bone as a sesamoid, obviously it's not, but if you think about the calcaneum as a sesamoid in between the Achilles and you just think about it as an extension of the Achilles, it pretty much, you know, could be argued that it's in that same, you know, plane and it will you know, be part of that uh, tendon. So that's that's my view on it. Um, it's, uh, it is, yeah, very much debated and just another question here and this is, it's this is one that's always interests me too about the that sort of the insertional enthesiitis tendinopathy that happens in the seronegative arthropathies now my own clinical experience and i don't have much in this is that 100 percent failure mm -hmm. uh, you have someone with heel pain and a seronegative the enthesiitis um it just it, it, in response to the biologic agents used to treat the disease process um, yeah. yeah, what I find interesting is when you pick up a rheumatology textbook and go to the chapter on foot pain, you look at your pain, they talk about strapping, they talk about orthotics, they talk about all these local treatments. And I think, well, mm. it's never worked for me. So I just don't know what your view is on the, the, the management of those in the seronegative type arthropathies. Yeah, look, I uh, think they're definitely challenging. They're definitely, definitely challenging. They, um, they can present with uh, very interesting and different pathologies and lots of fluid around the tendon and lots of different presentations. Um, I had one the other day uh, that was just, yeah, really an Achilles, but um, lots of just really interesting um, fluid and paratenin and, and bursa fluid. I think they just, they are different. They can sometimes settle down really quickly with anti-inflammatory drugs because they are so inflammatory. Um, but I, I, I would always, uh, team up with a uh, rheumatologist, send them to a rheumatologist, a GP who can offer the anti-inflammatory management. And I think my role in those cases is just to do simple management, simple rehab that's not going to irritate them uh, because the last thing you want to do with someone like that is flare them up. And uh, I just tend to be very, very, uh, I, I think I am a bit cautious with those ones just to see how they go with the rehab initially. But I think that, you know, obviously they need to be, anti-inflammatory managed as well perfect mm. great anything else greg or no there's look there's a couple other questions there but perhaps peter if he's got time later we'll, we'll share the link and just come and answer them a couple of simple little questions there um we've, we've hit the hour so look so thanks so much peter it's been really good we've had a lot of people watching live um i will get this up i will get this up on youtube and to the podcast later on in the day no so thanks again peter thanks, thanks peter. Chris. Thank you very much.